ourselves.
From this spot, visitors often mistake the series of cascades on Haystack Creek directly in front of them for Birdwoman Falls. But Birdwoman Falls is actually the 492-foot drop across the valley between Mount Oberlin on the left and Mount Cannon on the right. Notice the broad U-shaped bowl above the waterfall and look down the valley to the right and notice the same broad U-shape. Both features are the results of glaciers. I'm Dan Fagu of the U.S. Geological Survey's Northern Rocky Mountain Science Center. I've been a research ecologist here at Glacier National Park for the past 21 years. Birdwoman Falls is a classic example of a glacially sculpted landscape. Uh, this area has been under a lot of pressure in the last glaciation that ended about 12,000 years ago and lasted for hundreds of thousands of years. And this has allowed the landscape to be molded by the ice through time. The main trunk of the glacier sculpted out the area below Logan Pass and swept down around and actually scooped out Lake McDonald. The side valley there uh, didn't have as much cutting power because the ice in there was not as massive and so it couldn't cut down as fast as the main valley floor and so it lagged behind and therefore when all the ice melted it was suspended and we call that a hanging valley and that's what Birdwoman Falls drains out of. Walk with me on the garden wall On an autumn day when the wild geese call As they fly for winter stay In other places far away Walk with me and see the goats on the mountainside in their brand new coats standing bright against the sky looking down on you and I walk with me where the eagles fly and tumble wildly through the sky giving truth to ancient words Sometimes love is for the birds Walk with me where the big horns climb And do a dance as old as time Crashing heads till they might die And never even asking why Grizzlies roam in the places that they call home. Alpine meadows, flower filled, and hanging valleys, glacier chilled. Walk with me where the north winds blow and whisper of the coming snow, tossing golden leaves on high as summer birds bid their goodbye. Lords of everything they see, the world around both you and me, these and other things you'll see if you come.
this year being a heavy snow year, we started at the lodge and right in the beginning the snow depth was above what I'd say normal, maybe heavier than normal. So ever since we started, you know, going up the road, it's taken a little longer, the snow depths being what they are, you know, you don't proceed quite as fast. So we've had to push a lot more snow, blow a lot more snow, and instead of making a lot better headway as we move up the road and like an avalanche, the area there was five to six feet deep just on the level. And so that takes us a little longer. And then every one of the chutes that we got in lower haystack, lower BPR, Red Rock, especially Red Rock twice, we had to go through there because of the, the avalanche slide that came in there first in the spring when we got to it. And then about a week later, it slid in again. So that you know, delays two or three days here, two or three days there. And it's just a matter of, you know, there's more snow to move and it takes longer to do it you know, pretty much all the time. And each time we come up a section of the road, you know, there's more obstacles than maybe there would have been a year before or two years before. So less than normal is not what it is this year. Well, here in this particular spot, the snow builds up and it's pretty deep here. There's, there's a pretty big drift right going into the rim rock. So you have your road profile on the hillside like this. As long as you have ground or dirt here to support your snow activities, you're good with the machine. But once you start pushing out and building up a big, large area of snow, then that snow can slide off. So right here, we're gonna have to cut it all down and push it back to the rotary. And the rotary's gonna have to launch it off and over the hill. And that's what goes on. It might seem kind of, why are they doing it this way? But that's the whole idea that they're doing it this way is because they cannot get out on the snow. Because if they get out on the snow with the machines, the possibility of the snow breaking loose, and that's what happened a few years ago when the one machine broke, you know, slid down. Unfortunately, it was, you know, a good place to happen. Other places aren't so good to happen. So that's what they'll be doing. And this is a uh, not a real safe area because it's real steep. It's straight down, so the machines are parked over there at night on the other side of Oberlin or way back. So now we have to wait for them to come back through the rim rock, and then they'll start working this down. And it'll take a little while, but that's where we'll be going. Well, that's our operator, Casey Glade, in the excavator. And this is the rim rock area, and there's a lot of problems with rock falls, and the snow is just full of rocks and debris, and we can't use the rotary in there. So what he's doing is trying to get as much snow off the road as he can, obviously, but you can see how the snow builds up along the wall. And so he can reach up there and he can pull off any of that residual snow that's left on the wall that would tip, tip out later and close the road or tip down on a car, something like that. So he's pulling a lot of that residual snow, that high snow down and then he's getting the dirty rocks and stuff and, and throwing them over the side. He can stay on the road bed, more or less, on the snow surface and he can throw, he's able with that long arm to throw the material out over the side. He's probably, he's probably about, I might guess, maybe 12, 15 feet above the road surface right there where he is. Here's the rim rock is deep. It just seems to get more of a drifted type snow. This isn't as much prone to avalanche buildup as it is. It's, this is the, the normal snow depth, I'd say, in, in the rim rock. You know, yeah, there's been years where there's 20 feet deep instead of 30, 30 40, you know, 40 deep. But it, it's a little above normal, but the rim rock is usually fairly deep. It's like the big drift. It, it doesn't get too much less one winter to the other, you know, or one spring to the other. Trying to, but it just takes longer because it's a, you know, a bigger area, a lot more snow, and, and, and so yeah, the rim rock is above normal, but it's fairly deep all the time. But this is not so untypical of a day as far as on the mountain in the rim rock or in the alpine section.
It's Monday, April 18th, about 11.30. We're here on a north-facing slope about 6,000 feet, um, just a, between Red Rock Slide Path and uh, Slide Path 54.1. Um, like I said, north-facing slope. And over the weekend, we had a really good storm last three days. About a foot and a half of uh, new snow, totaling over two inches of water. And uh, the storm came in just how we like it. It came in warm and left cold, so fairly right side up snowpack. But the snow, this new snow did fall on a variety of snow surfaces. And we're seeing um, as we get higher in elevation, uh, mainly above 5,500 feet, it's becoming increasingly, um, it's becoming easier to trigger slides. And, you know, we just stepped out onto this uh, roll here. We got this thing to fracture and slide. And, you know, do a quick shovel shear here. As you can see, this column just pops right out on this harder surface. And these are conditions that we're seeing in the slide paths, which um, could affect the road. I don't think so. No, thank goodness. Yeah, me, Bust me it in half. Go smaller, yeah. Bust it in half and then move it. Move the head. Okay, let me pick that up. Ten years old. <laughs> okay, what else we need to do? Sticks, okay. We're, the sticks got buried, didn't they? That's like way too long. Yeah. That's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's perfect. Hey, hey, hey! <laughs> Hurt somebody there. <laughs> Hey David. Hey Laura, what are you doing? Oh my gosh, we're getting ready for our education programs. They start next week here in the park and we have a winter ecology field trips, first graders all the way up to high school come out to the park. And one of the things we really like to do is talk to them about snow. Snow has so many cool properties. And here at Glacier, we have lots of snow. <laughs> so we like to talk about insulation and how snow can be great insulation. Birds use it, a lot of the subnivian creatures use it. And so what we do, people have used it for thousands and thousands of years. The Baskin people used it and they built Quincy. So you can see kind of behind me here, got a couple of our education staff working on a Quincy. We piled up a huge pile of snow last night. And now we're digging it out so that we have a little cave over here and we've just put flags in it so we don't dig out too much. So we want our, we want our cave walls to be pretty thick, at least 10 inches thick. And um, it's really setting up well. So it should be a nice strong shelter. And then a little bit further back uh, are a couple of the rangers working on an igloo. So a different kind of snow shelter and it's 
mainly made out of blocks of snow, which we, our snow right now is not that great for making blocks, so they're having to really pack it in to get those blocks to set up in the back over there. But it's a great opportunity to just see how cool snow can be and how much it helps some of the animals and people survive in the winter. Great, how many, how many um, classes and students come by in the winter? Ooh, let's see. Well, starting next week, we'll have classes pretty much every day here until mid-March. Yeah, and it's usually two classes a day. Yeah. And on weekends, we have snowshoeing programs? Yeah, for the public, 10.30 and 1.30 every Saturday and Sunday, the rangers have uh, snowshoe hikes. They last about an hour and a half, and they're just right across the street from here. They start at the visitor center, and the snowshoes are a small fee for use during the ranger program.